about the words in Luke chapter 14. I'm going to be reading verses 25 through, through 35. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. I want to say that the words that I'm going to speak today is a, this is the way that we are honestly for the church to grow or an individual to grow. This is God's church growth method, believer method. Now great crowds accompanied him and he turned to them and said to them, and I'm going to be reading out of the ESV. You can put whatever translation on there is fine. I'm going to be reading from the ESV. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, cannot be my disciple. What a way to start a message off. <laughs> you see, Jesus here starts, and, it's a, it's a, and, and I love it because it says, Now great crowds accompanied him. See, Jesus did not need, he honestly didn't ask people, he, uh, he did not ask the crowds, hey, I'm, I'm going to have a meeting here within three days, I want everyone to show up. He didn't do that. The crowds just followed where Christ was because something was happening. But when he sees this large crowd, I think most churches would be like, yes, let's run up and take up an offering right now. You know, that's step number one, take up an offering. Because after the end of the message, you might have less people. So you take up the offering first, but Jesus didn't do that. He starts off his message by trying to dwindle the crowd down. You see, because Jesus was more than just after a big crowd. In John chapter 6, 5 or 6, it says that he knew the hearts of men. And that's why he never committed himself to them. Because the individuals were just being drawn by the bread he gave and the fish that he gave. He gave literally free food to people. And then all this crowd started to gather. But he said he didn't commit himself to them because of that. And says, now great crowds accompanied him. And he turned and said to them. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The word here, hate, I know it's translated in a few different ways. Some say it's the word hate is you prefer not. You, um, let me see here. I'm going to read it better. Prefer less. That you prefer your mother, your father, everyone less than Christ. I honestly like how the, uh, the NLT translates it because they say, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. So in comparison to Christ, everyone else should be in such a far removed uh, gap that everyone, Christ is up here and everyone's down here. It's not even, I have a first, a second, a third, a fourth, no, it's Christ and then everything else. Amen. Amen. He says that if this is not part of your life, that's not hate. Everyone that is around him, people that are precious to him, and even his own life cannot be my disciple. The word cannot means cannot. That's, that's how simple it is. You can't be Christ's disciple. This is, this is Jesus saying. Yes. This is Jesus saying that if you do not prefer me above everyone else, if you do not hate everyone else in comparison to me, you cannot be my disciple. But he doesn't stop there about everyone else because it's honestly more easier to hate or to prefer everyone else less than Christ. Uh, I mean, prefer everyone less, um, else less than Christ. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and even his own life. That's right. That makes it a little even more challenging. Yes, yes. Cannot be my disciple. 
You see, a disciple, I know there's the more the most practical definition is just means a learner. But a Christian disciple is a individual, a a, a, a person who learns from Christ. Right. Amen. See, a lot of there's been a lot of disciple seminars, disciple teachings, a lot of people teach on discipleship. But it's always, I notice the discipleship is always discipled after you. Like I'm going to teach you how to, I'm going to give you an example and then you imitate me. But really that's not Christian discipleship. Christian discipleship is, is, is me pointing you to Christ yes. and saying you individual imitate Christ. Yes. Yes. You imitate Christ. I honestly, people that I talk to, people that I, you know, that I've, uh, you know, talk with the word. I honestly don't want them to be like me. Amen. I want them to be like Christ. Yes. Whatever whatever that looks like for them, that's what I want for yes. them. Because a lot of times you have so many individuals, we all have carbon copies. And before you know, you know, I grew up in a church that was like that. You literally make carbon copies of yourself. And then honestly, you end up just getting a bunch of religion because everyone is a carbon copy of each other. And you can't tell, you know, one person from another and it's, and it's not in a good way. That's right. That's right. But here Jesus says, like I said, I, I want to repeat that again because it's, it's strong. If anyone, come, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So that's the, just the first requirement. We even haven't gone any further yet, but that's already the first requirement. But then he continues, he gets a little bit more stronger. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. It gets stronger because Jesus says not only, like I said, prefer, if you want to use that word, prefer, Jesus is up here and everyone else is down here. Like I said, there, there's no two, three, four, five. There's not Christ, family, church. It doesn't work like that. It's Christ and everyone else. Yes, yes. Then he continues and I'm going to read it again. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, it says it this way. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And Mark chapter 8, verse 34. You see, not only are you to have Jesus up here, and everyone else down here. But you are literally, the Jesus is saying, you have to die to yourself, your yes. self-will, your self, wh 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 uh, whatever you want that to be. That self must go, yes. must yes. die, it must be gone. And you have to embrace the will of God, no matter the cost. Yes. Yes. This is what Jesus is teaching here. And does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Mm. Your self-will must go. Yes. It must die. And then on top of not just your self-will dying, you have to embrace God's will, God's way, no matter the cost. That's what's taking up the cross is. It's embracing the will of God, no matter the cost. Yes, yes. Amen. No matter the cost. No matter the cost. Now these are strong words that I've just spoken to you. I know whenever we do altar calls, we don't say this stuff. You know, we, we say, you know, if you have turmoil inside, pain, you know, come to Christ. I say the same thing. But then this is a, 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 this is even deeper because Jesus is not just, Jesus is, is taking it to an, an extreme that is only so extreme that it only can be done through the power of Christ. Amen. Amen. Only through him. Amen. And then he gets on to, to help you understand what he is saying. He says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation 
and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. It gives you the first example about counting the cost. And I'm going to read you the, uh, the second, uh, second example he uses. For what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whenever he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Jesus here is, is, is talking about counting cost. You see, when you come to Christ, there's a cost. Yes, like amen. I already said, Jesus already said here, there's a massive cost you have to pay. But he's telling you, Christ is through his word. He's saying, don't rush into this decision. Actually sit down and figure out the cost. You see, because whenever you build a home, there's a lot of hurdles you have to go through. You have to purchase the land. You have to go. Well, first you have to see the zoning restrictions and requirements, see what type of house you can build. If you can put the mobile home on the land and after you do all that, then you have to start. You have to do all the planning. You have to go through and, and make sure that, you know, after the requirements are met, now you have to go through the planning to see if the structure is appropriate for the house. If there's a flood zone, you want to, you know, above flood plain, you know, and so it goes. And then when you start to build a house, then you have to go, those permits are always a mess. I promise you start dealing with them. It's a mess because one inspector says one thing, another says another thing. The book says a third thing. And you don't know who to believe, but Jesus has to stick with the inspector because he's the one who's going to pass you or not. And then, it, and then you go through a process to build a home. Like I said, you, have, you know, you have to level out the ground. You have to put, if you, if you have city water, septic, you know, all that. You have to go through a massive process just to get the home built. But before you do all of that, even before you buy the land, what do you do? You sit down and you count the cost. Can I afford the two by fours? Can I afford the mobile home? Can I afford this? Can I afford the roof? Can I afford all the other individuals that are licensed and uh licensed license just means when someone's licensed just means a lot of money i promise if you're a licensed plumber it just means it's gonna be a lot of money you're gonna pay licensed electrician just that word itself it always means that so you have to count the cost and usually you call someone up you call up a uh either you do it yourself or or you call up a contractor another contractor also means extra money <laughs> but you, you but you call people up and you figure out before you even start is it within my budget mm -hmm. That's good. it takes work like i said i you know i flip homes maybe it's in the middle teens now i don't i don't remember i lost count after 10. but uh and there's some homes i didn't count the cost well Honestly, I did not. And I made some very, very poor choices. And I'm pretty sure people who flip homes, you know, after, you know, one or two, five, ten, you start to realize, you know, there's mistakes you make that if you don't properly <laughs> inspect the house, you don't properly look at things and you don't make the right budget and actually stick to a budget. It's not just, you know, some weird, you know, numbers on a page, but you have to stick to it. And I have times that I have not stick to it. It's like ah, this, this. Oh, well, I know the house price is going to increase if I had this and this. And before you know it, you're over budget by thousands of dollars. And now the house can't sell because you assumed something that wasn't a reality. Because you didn't count the cost. And then he gives you, a sec, uh, Jesus gives a sec, second example about a king going out with another king in war. And once again... The, the king who's gone out to fight another king, he has to count the cost. Do I have enough weapons? Do I have enough soldiers? Do I have enough of resources to actually win this war? Honestly, I wish our politicians would, you know, read this verse especially. That we would count costs before we go to war and say, can we actually win this war? And what is the, what is the cost you have to pay? 
Because this king, the Bible says, is figures it out. And he figures out, I can't fight this war. Because I have 10,000. This guy over here has 20,000. He's a lot better equipped than me. So what am, what am I going to do? I'm going to go out and I'm going to meet him. And we're going to create peace. Because I'd rather create peace on my terms than him coming over here. And I have to create peace on his terms. But right here, Jesus is trying to get across that there is energy that is spent to determine cost. That's right. To be a true disciple of Christ, like I said, one who learns from Christ, we must count the cost. Is, am I going to endure till the end? Mm. Am I going to endure all the way? This is not, I go halfway and, and then I drop out. No, no, and it, can I make it all the way with Christ? Am I all in? No. Or is it just a little bit here and a little there? And Jesus is saying, count the cost. Count the cost. Will you be able to endure? You see, a lot of times we think of salvation as a one moment experience. I said yes to Christ and that's it. And now I'm saved and, and it's all good from now. But really in the Bible, when you read salvation, salvation, yes, happens instantly. Christ coming into your heart and now the power of the Holy Spirit abiding in you. But it's also is a is a salvation is also uh, takes time. Salvation, that's what the Bible says. He who endures till the end shall be saved. If you said yes to Jesus five years ago and now you ain't living for God, you've lost your way with God. It didn't honestly matter that you said five years ago because now you're in a worse place than you were five years ago. You see, it, that's not what salvation is. Salvation is a, is, is a lifestyle. It's you starting from point A and you for the rest of eternity living out Christianity. Amen. And then, so the first requirement, usually I, I don't really care about points, but the Bible literally lays out three points for us. It says you have to hate everyone around you and yourself. Second, you have to take up a cross and follow after Christ. You have to deny the self, will, self, whatever self that you have, you need to lay it down. And you take up God, your will, no matter the cost. And then the third one says, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all. Man, this is some serious language here. Renounce all that has that that he has cannot be my disciple. You would think what is left by now? Like the, the, the two are already pretty serious. Everyone else. Myself, Christ number one, taking up cross, taking up, denying my self will, denying all of that, laying that all aside and then following his will. But then just in case something is left out, Jesus says, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all other translations, I think like King James uh, use the word here. Let me look here. Um, forsake. I think it's used forsake. I don't know if that's James, but uh, I think it's used forsake. But really, it means it means renounce. Forsake. It's translated in different ways. Leave. Farewell. Forsake. That means you can't be in company with it. it means all means all. Everything has to go. And if everything does not go, what does Jesus say? You cannot be my disciple. If you are not willing to let everything go and Christ be preeminent in your life, then you cannot be my disciple. These are serious words. Because there are going to be so many individuals in the book of Matthew that talks about they're going to come into heaven and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we heal in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all of these things in your name? And Jesus is going to say, I didn't even know who you are. Depart from me. I mean, that's pretty impressive resume. 
healing the sick, casting demons out. I mean, that's impressive. But Jesus here is not saying that your requirement is to cast demons out and your requirement is to heal the sick. He's not saying that's a requirement. No, he's saying the requirement for you is to let yourself die that yes, Christ yes. might live. Amen. That's requirement Hallelujah. number one. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus requires. He doesn't require the works that you do. He requires you to put your faith totally in Him. And not only just, I know a lot of times we say faith, you think something invisible, I, I put my faith, and then you go off and do whatever you want. Hallelujah. It doesn't work like that. Whenever you put your faith in Christ and Christ alone, Christ crucified, there is going to be a byproduct. Yes. You, you know, and an individual who's not a disciple of Christ is when there's no product, there, there, there's no work, there's no action for that. You can't see a result. There's no yes. fruit there. Yes. Yes. Jesus talks about that too. I'm going to keep coming back to this tree and I'm going to give it manure. One more time, I'm going to put manure on this tree. Because the servant said, um, the, uh, the master said, let's cut this tree down. Let's cut it down. It's useless. But Jesus, as a servant, says just one more. Give it one more season. Okay. One more year. Just one more time. If I can put a little bit of manure on there and for it to grow, I'm going to try one last time. Yes, yes. And I feel like that's what Jesus is Calling the church say, I'm giving them one more chance. Yes, yes. Because we, for many, many years in the church, we have lost our way. We made it about everything else. And then on top of that, when God has given us insight into His precious work, we still somehow made it all about ourselves. Yes. And Jesus, I feel like there's been a call. I, I, I see it all around me. There, it, literally, all around me, there's just been... People of every stripe, people I never even, you know, different belief systems. They're all, there's been a call and a hunger in people's hearts to return back to Christ yes. and Christ crucified. Yes. There's been a cry in people's heart. Why? Because that's the call of the last, the last days is for us to go back. Because if not, we're going to be cut right at, we're, we are going to be cut right at the root. And I don't want individuals to be so fooled into thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm a disciple. And then you get there, I promise, you don't want to get to the judgment. Oh, Lord, you don't want to get to the judgment and find out that you didn't make it. Oh, yes, Lord. You want to find out here that you never made it. Yes. Here, today. Because yes. at the judgment, it doesn't, it's too late. That's right. It's too late. The time was already passed. Even all these impressive resumes. I honestly don't know a lot of people who cast demons out and heal the sick. I mean, that's a pretty impressive word. Both combined together. And then on top of that, they did other things for Christ. But that is the call I feel in these days is to come to Christ like Pastor Matt said. Christ and Christ alone deserves the glory. Yeah. Only Christ. And there is, the Bible talks about a winning, uh, uh, the fan that's in his hand that is cleansing, cleansing the church, cleansing the body. But then he gets into something very interesting here in verse 34 and 35. He says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You see, most of the salt of that day that they would consume was from the Dead Sea. And Dead Sea salt has impurities in that salt. And those impurities had to be separated from the salt, that the salt would be good. But here Jesus is saying, right here is using an example of when the salt impurities weren't cleaned, the impurities weren't properly processed, and it has such a poor taste to it, that they tossed it out. And this is not only did they toss it out, but it wasn't even good for the manure pile. And 
in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, it says, thrown out and trampled under people's feet. That's the only use that it has. And I heard a minister say this, it really touched my heart. But he says, if you don't allow God to purify you as the, as the salt was purified and had to make sure that the impurities were, were gone, that you are going to be tossed under people's feet. And what does that mean? And he explained it. And I really was like, it shook me on the inside. He said, you will be an example to others as they walk. Do not be like this person. Do not be like this person. Because this person lost the way. This person couldn't endure till the end. Don't let your life be an example to others of how not to live for Christ. Amen. Please don't. Amen. But instead, have your life as an example of how you should follow after Christ. Because you don't want that example. We have plenty of people that you know that are, are, are an example. And some of you were that example. But Jesus still reached down, like yes, I said, and hallelujah. picked you up. Hallelujah. And praise God for that. Thank you, Lord. But our time is limited. Amen. There's a cost you have to pay. There's a cost. And that cost is everything. Yes, yes. That's it. It's everything. I know it sounds simple. It's so hard at times to do. Because Jesus, see, uh, hey, Christianity is not... You know, a lot of times we look at a person that we, you know, say stereotype or whatever. Say, you know, oh, this person's fire for God. They're zealous. They're reading the word. They're praying. They're just, they're just in love with Jesus. Wow, they're just so on fire. And we think that that's abnormal. Jesus is saying that that's not abnormal. That's the norm. Yes. You see, if you're looking at that and saying, man, I want to be, I, I wish I was that then I'm going to tell you right now, you are not following after the ways of God. You are lacking of surrendering everything to Christ. Because in a relationship, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm married to Kristen, is she wouldn't be okay if I brought somebody else home. Say, hey, you know? Or I show up 2, 3 a.m. in the morning and, you know, I have someone else on the side. No, why? Because she's jealous, but she's in love. She's in love with me. And she's saying, no, I don't want anyone except me. That's the same thing with Christ. And I don't understand why we so, so much, so many times we think that Christ is, Christ is okay with us yes. literally committing spiritual adultery yes, with yes. others, with other things that isn't Him. <clears throat> While we ourselves would not be okay if someone brought, you know, their boo, some, another boo over and said, hey, you know, this boo's going to come live with us. You say, no, get out. You get out or boo gets out, but somebody's going to get out of here, you know? And that's, you know, and that's what Jesus is saying, you know, boo, get out, you know? So it has to go in your life. Yes. Everything must go. Christ must be preeminent. He must be preeminent. This individual, like I described, that we always say, oh, they're so zealous, they're in love. No, that should be a regular, that should be just the norm. Yes. Because that is the norm in the Bible. Yes. That's the norm of living for God. It's having a, 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 a zeal in your heart, a desire that just consumes you, that you're so in love. It's not forced, it's not made. If someone has to force you to talk to your spouse or talk to your friends. I'm going to tell you, the relationship is not going to last long. Right. But that relationship lasts because there's love in it. No, that it's not just, and not just, it just, love, oh, I say I love you, but you actually show that you love them. You spend time with the individual. You spend time. Because to me, time is a great way to show how much someone loves somebody. If you're always busy running around, 10, 15 minute phone call, you know, a day, you know, show up and you barely see the individual. That shows how much importance the individual is to you. That they're second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth down the line. That they're not the most important. But you know who your best friends are or how? Because they spend time with you. They want to know you. They give you a phone call. They talk to you. 
They do different activities with you because you know that they want to be with you. It's not forced. And that's the same thing with Christ. It shouldn't be a force for us to go into the prayer closet. There should be a burning desire of love in our hearts because we love Jesus. And even as it is in a relationship in the natural, it's the same way in the spiritual. That not every single day or is your feelings going to be, you know, top of the line. You're always, you know, uh, you know, just just having such a great time every single day. But sometimes you kind of wake up a little bit grumpy. You know, like, I, you know, I slept on these chairs on a, well, technically it was Saturday morning for like a few hours. You know, and you wake up and it's like, oh, you know, things hurt. Those chairs ain't the most comfortable to sleep on. So it's not like, you know, I'm going to jump out, you know, and be like, yeah, I love everyone. You know, it, it doesn't, I mean, if you are the individual, then I say, you know, that's, that's awesome. It really is. But we get grumpy and, and we have, but still, when you love someone, you're still going to spend time with them. Right. You're still going to exert energy into them. So don't be like this individual that's just that salt. That's right. The people are walking in. I remember this individual. They were serving God. They used to seek God. They used to, they used to pray in the Spirit. They used to worship God. They used to meditate on the Lord. They used to bless me with words of encouragement. They used to do so much mighty exploits for the kingdom of heaven. But now they've lost their way because they couldn't count the cost. I want us to read in Luke chapter 22 in closing. Verses 39 through 46. Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 46. I know John told me to minister for an hour and a half, but that's a little too long for me. Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 46. And now you can come back and... And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he had come to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. You see, Jesus here shows us what it means to surrender. Because he was he was the a perfect man and perfect God. But on this earth he lived to show us how we should live for the Father in heaven. There's a way to live for our Father in heaven. And those that are fathers are men in the house. There's a way that we too must live. You know, honestly, if you look biblically, being a man is a very, very challenging thing. Because a man is supposed to show his family what Jesus is all about. Not only that, he's supposed to show his family how to love how Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Yes. And that's a lot of responsibility. And that's a very, very hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do unless you're dead. You know, there's a saying that I probably repeated on Friday or Saturday. I don't remember now. But it was that dead man tell no tales. When you're dead, you're dead. You can't talk. It's the same thing that Jesus is showing us here. That when you're surrendered to, to His will, as He was to the Father, we surrender to Christ everything. That we are dead. So now, like I said, 
To get there takes agony. It takes pain. It takes you having to count the cost. But when you let it go and say, Christ, you're worth everything. You're worth my entire life. You are worth everything. Now his life can live through you. And that's, I would say, the easy part. Because now it's not you who are living, but it's Christ that is living through you. And here we see Jesus Christ say, not my will, but your will be done. It says there was agony there. But I love it, we skipped so quickly. It says, the, an angel came and strengthened him as he was knelt down over a rock crying. Tears flowing with blood already before the cross even happened. Before he was actually nailed, the process of the passion was already started. Him surrendering his will to Christ. You see, before you can carry your cross, you have to surrender everything to Christ. He has knelt over, weeping, tears flowing, his pores busting, blood flowing. It says an angel comes and strengthens him. Do you know why that blesses me? Because Jesus at that moment needed help. As a man, he needed help. How much more then do we need help? And we do have help. We have the power of the Holy Spirit abiding in us. We have His Word to give us strength. We have that prayer closet that we can lock ourselves up and get the strength that we need. But it doesn't stop there. We have each other right here. That's why I got you to pray for one another. Because we have each other that are supposed to hold each other while an individual is knelt down and they're being pressed by God. Because that's what Gethsemane means. A place where the olive oil is being pressed. While we are being pressed, the Holy Spirit is strengthening us. And we have believers that are around us that are encouraging us. Encouraging us, praising. I, I've been there. I've been there where I was pressed. I have been there when I had to give my everything to Christ. You see, that's why it says to take up the cross. It's not a one moment experience. To take it up, but it's daily experience. It's to lay that self aside, saying, Lord, I'm gonna take up your work, what you have given to me. I'm gonna take that up. I'm gonna deny everything around me because I want you. And you today here might not understand everything, but you know the good thing is, Jesus, when he picked his disciples, didn't call all the brightest. He truly didn't, but he called a common. And I believe the reason he did that because he wanted to prove to everyone, if I can use just the common Joe or the common John, then I can use anyone. It doesn't take a lot of intellect. It doesn't take a lot of, of wisdom. It just takes simple faith yes. and desire in the heart. And that's, I want us to stand. And if this message touched you, and you're like, you know what? I haven't laid everything down yet. I'm not there. I'm not there. I'm still not a true learner of Christ. But I want to be. I want you to come down. And if they're not, if, if, I want you to come down right now. And if you say on the other hand, you know what, I don't have this desire in my heart. I'm just, you're just, you felt a little bit of conviction. But yet it, it, it's just not there all the way yet. I also want you to come down and say, Lord, give me that desire. Oh, we thank you, Jesus.